Hey everyone, and welcome to the Flat Earth Digest, episode 12. This episode showcases the best Flat Earth goodness that I've found since the Eclipse episode I did a few weeks ago. So it basically covers videos released between uh, August 28th and September 20th uh, or 21st. And anyway, I'm trying to move past the Eclipse buzz, but it's evident that we're all still studying it hardcore, and rightfully so. But anyway, I'll get to that in a moment. I wanted to mention that um, I'm working on the first actual Hori Sheet Show, episode one, which will feature things that are not related to the Flat Earth. Things like the possible geoengineering that may have helped uh, cause these recent hurricanes, uh, mm -hmm. the most recent hoaxes and false flags, you know, like these vans and trucks running people over everywhere, and those crisis actors getting caught up in multiple events. Also, I might touch on other huge conspiracies like, you know, the Mandela effect, uh, underground tunnels, human cloning, pretty much anything that would make you think, holy sh**, because uh, after all, the Hori Sheet Show is the closest you're going to get to any kind of holy sh** show anytime soon. But anyway, I'm going to try to find the most legit information about anything that I cover, if that's even possible. And now, on to what everybody really came here for, the Flat Earth News. Now, first up, here's an interesting bit from the Flat Earth Podcast with Curious J and DITRH. It turns out that not everyone uh, falls for the indoctrination after they hear it. And some people uh, weren't even indoctrinated like the rest of us. I want you to soak this in and be sure to catch the rest of this podcast because DITRH is the man. And he puts on a quality production. Kudos to David and Curious J. Great job. I'd like to uh, read an email that came in from Kevin the gym teacher that was on our episode three. I'd love to read it, Dave, real quick. You, you know what this is about, because I think it's yep. worth it. Everyone should hear this. Go for it. So today I was having a conversation with my downstairs neighbor, Mabel. She's a very nice woman. I'd say she's probably around 60 years old. She was born and raised in Antigua. Earlier today, I gave her a ride to the post office, and I figured I might bring up the subject of flat earth. So I said to her, Mabel, do you read the Bible? She said, of course I do. So then I said to her, have you ever seen references in the Bible that talk about the firmament and how the earth is fixed and immovable? And she said, yes, of course. So then I said, then you know that that means the earth is flat. And she said, well, of course the earth is flat. And here I was ready to do battle with her when she has known in her entire life that the earth is flat. So here's the twist. She told me that when she was growing up in Antigua, she learned geography under the British system because Antigua was run by Britain. That is what she was taught in school, that the earth was flat. She knew all about the flat earth. And when I was explaining to her that 99% of the people in the world now believe that we live on a spinning globe, she laughed and thought that was ridiculous. Now, a simplified version of a ball killer is explained pretty eloquently in episode 7 of the Flat Earth Podcast, when David Weiss explains that given the math and sizes of the Earth and Moon, if the Moon is creating a certain size shadow on the Earth during a total solar eclipse and the Sun's over here, then by simply reversing the Moon and Earth's position to make it basically a lunar eclipse at that point, we should be seeing a much uh, smaller Earth shadow eclipsing the moon. He gives this explanation with a few more numbers, but tell me down in the comments below if you think this is a simple globe killer to run with, all thanks to this uh, recent eclipse. When the, the, the narrowing shadow hits the Earth, um, it's 70 miles wide. Well, when you swap the position of the moon and the Earth, which would be a, a lunar eclipse, um, using their same math with umbra and penumbra, the width of the Earth, Earth's shadow would be 256 miles wide, which would be the size of a tennis ball on uh, passing in front of a small beach ball. Right. And But that's not what we see. We see the entire sun get... Uh, the entire moon get eaten by the shadow, which, you know, from the curve of it that proves that it's, you know, round, supposedly, um, is is bigger than the moon. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like so you can't to me, to me, that's a ball killer right there. 
Yeah. Next up, and this one kind of dovetails right on into DITRH and what I just said a moment ago, and I don't know who came up with it first, but the Potter's Clay came through with a great video for us. It seems that Bob from Globebusters helped with some brainstorming here as well, and the video is really the result of two great minds and showcases the fact that during the Great American Solar Eclipse, the shadow created on Earth was about 70 miles wide, and this is considerably smaller than the moon, right? But during a lunar eclipse, the shadow of Earth is quite large on the moon. It's massive, in fact. It actually, you know, eclipses the moon and more. But the thing is, the distance to the sun is still pretty much the same for both kinds of eclipses, like I said a moment ago. And this really doesn't sound right at all when you look at it critically, okay? The video entertains the fact that the same kind of lighting effect should happen to both, and that the shadow on the moon should be approximately 256 miles wide, given that Earth is about four times bigger than the moon. And what I'm saying is an Earth that's four times bigger would simply leave a four times bigger shadow on the moon, right? But wait, the moon is like more than 2,000 miles across. So do you see what I'm getting at here? The Earth's shadow on the moon should not take up the entire size of the moon. It shouldn't even come close. If anyone can shoot holes in this one, please do so in the comments below. But this is a thought-provoking one for sure, and it seems to, to show a huge hole in the heliocentric model. Here, take a look at this visual of what I'm trying to say and pause it if necessary. <laughs> Next up, Dell from Beyond the Imaginary Curves YouTube channel and Gav, a gentleman with an honors degree in math and physics, joined a podcast with Eddie Bravo recently to discuss the Flat Earth. In this two-hour-long podcast, they discussed the reason why scientists may all be quote-unquote in on it. And it's not because they are malicious people who are happy being in a cult. They just don't know it's a cult. Wait, what? Well, you're right. I know that that might sound offensive, but people really need to realize that we've been fooled, bamboozled. The wool has been pulled over the eyes of many intelligent people. And we're seeing more and more people with credentials and degrees coming forward as self-declared flat earthers because Guess what? The truth is undeniable. Yeah. Have a listen to this. And a big thanks goes out to Dell and Gav and Eddie Bravo for speaking publicly about this stuff. What, one of the most common things people say when you're discussing flat earth is, but how could all the scientists be wrong? How could they all be in on this? All the scientists. What do you say to those guys? Well, <clears throat> so, uh, mathematics is a formal science. You've, you'll have heard that before. Um, and a formal science is just like a language. So there's a, a distinction between a formal science like mathematics and a natural science. Um, formal science is all about definitions. Um, it's all about the meanings of words. So a mathematician can believe whatever definitions and axioms. And if he then, you know, following from those definitions and axioms comes to conclusions, then he will believe them if he believes his definitions. Um, so there's no conspiracy that lots of scientists are all in on this game. What they don't realize is that the definitions and assumptions and axioms in which they're basing their reasoning are fallacious. They're the things that are wrong, and they're the things that people need to start looking at, including academics. 
And next up, uh, I'm not too happy to be reporting this one, but uh, just in case there's any real truth to it, my Flat Earth family should know. Uh, so you remember that Russian physicist I spoke about in a few episodes ago? Well, I can't even pronounce his name, so I won't even try. But uh, this guy, remember him? Anyway, a guy named Philip has made a video saying that he was only joking and that he made that page to attempt to make a viral YouTube channel. Uh, anyway, he goes into detail about how he had two different channels and how it was his daughter's idea to get him to do this uh, flat earth stuff, but his colleagues started giving him trouble about it eventually. And I didn't watch the original videos where all this was supposedly mentioned on camera, but anyway, you can do your own research on this one. This guy should be, uh, this guy could be a flat earth shill. Check out Philip's channel for other flat earth videos and what it looks, uh, what looks to be a lot of different kinds of flood videos. Interesting stuff. It looks like he's trying to get his truth out there. So go check out his stuff. The link to his video and his channel uh, will be down below. Next up, Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes had an interview with Jerry DeCamp from the YouTube channel Subphotonic. They talked about all kinds of stuff in this video, really. Uh, they talked about energies and frequencies, and uh, they touched on things like astral projection, which I liked a lot, and titans, and uh, no forest on Flat Earth video. It was probably my favorite podcast from Patricia, so I had to mention, uh, mention it, and I seem to think a lot like Jerry when it comes to his views on this whole reality, so it was really cool to see somebody else who uh, kind of thinks along these lines. It's definitely worth checking out. Uh, here's a small clip from it, and as usual, the link will be down below in the video description. But people have a problem with talking about the earth in that way that it's enclosed. And I know you've probably come up against people who don't want to hear about a firmament, don't want to hear about an enclosure, and don't want to hear about a dome. And when asked, they say, because it's too limiting. What's your answer to that? I mean, how do we know it's limiting? There could be an infinite plane, I mean, for all we know. Um, but it, it does look like it. Anyway, we, there, there, could be, it imply, it, there could be many of these domes on this flat plane is what I'm saying. Who knows? We just don't know. But um, as far as limiting, you know, I mean, when you go to sleep every night, you're, you know, you're, you're out of your body. You know what I mean? Every night you're out of your body. You have to. You have to recharge or you die. Your spirit has to go recharge or you will die. Same, you know, with breathing. Spirit. Breath is spirit. So you have to. If you lose, that's the fastest thing. You lose spirit, you die immediately. Interesting. I love dreams. I love going to sleep. As a young girl till today, I've always looked forward to sleep. I sleep very easily and have great dreams. It's a treat. A lot of people have trouble falling. Down. Have you ever been out of your body and remembered or woken up out of your body? No, I have not. That, that will freaking, that will shake you up. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. Have you had that? And a lot of people call it like astral traveling and that's. Yeah, yeah. There's, you can, because, because I've done it. I mean, I haven't asked to travel, but I've been out of my body, you know, and like wondering what the hell is going on. <laughs> Next up, I, you know, I just wanted to say that I really think that this eclipse is one of the most fascinating phenomena that we've seen in a long time. And I'm not sold on this thing being the moon, which is mind blowing to me. But some people may be uh, going to great lengths to keep the heliocentric model alive and glurping. Yeah, I said glurping. That's a fitting term, right? Anyway, Mike Helmick put out a video claiming another YouTuber by the name of Soundly has faked an image of the eclipse to show a moon inside of it. Uh, I missed the episode where Soundly apparently went on Globebusters to reveal this find, but Mike Helmick seems to think that the image is faked and shows some compelling evidence to support his case in this video titled Soundly Globebusters Short Version. This video is the shorter version of something a bit longer that Mike put out and, um, you know, I can see what he's talking about with the, the pixelation issues. You be the judge. You see how crazy the, the how, how bad the pixel data is. Let let me show you the real the real image here. This pixel data, as opposed to this larger chunkier pixel data. Smooth pixel data, chunky pixel data. Smooth pixel data, chunky pixel data. And so the chunky pixel data is simply because somebody's overlaid a lower resolution image in here, mainly a a moon photo and. The other thing about this, unlike the other one, when we when we turn off the green and the blue, we still have our moon photo in here. But when I shut off this green channel, our moon photo disappears. And then once again, you can see the square box start to appear in here. And so this tells me 100% this image is fake, manipulated, and uh, 
you know, this this moon image should be on all these channels, which I showed in my other video. Unlike this uh, image here, this is original, and once again, if we, it stays the same. No, nothing changes, no matter what color channel you're on, and that's the way it should be. So, I found this uh, box, and I highlighted it in here. Here we can see that there's a box in here, and this box is in here because uh, Soundly or Sean or somebody overlaid a picture of the moon on top of this image. It's there. You can't hide it. It's not at all in this image here. This image here uh, is fine. It, it depixelates and equalizes evenly. This image here, not so much. I'll put another link down below for his other video. Take a look at it 42 minutes in to really get an idea for how this moon layer may be disappearing within the different RGB color channels. It's a really good look into just how complex it can be to dissect an image to see if it's been tampered with. Hats off to you, Mike. These guys are on top of it. Oh, and by the way, Bob from Globusters made a statement about all this on the 10th during his live stream titled Flat Earth Thinking Outside the Sphere, where he basically explained how he had Soundly on his show and they talked about the image that he presented and how you can see a moon inside of it. And then uh, Bob said that he simply got the image from Soundly so he could try to duplicate it himself and bring out the moon in the image too with all the software. And when he was able to do it in just a few minutes time, he decided to send it out to a few other people, which seemed to cause a big old stink. His, uh, ex his explanation starts about 10 minutes into that video, but in case you were wondering what Bob thought uh, about soundly deceiving everybody, well, all I know is he didn't start any of it, at least. He didn't send out the picture and infer that something was tampered with. That all happened organically. And I thought I'd help, you know, spread that through the grapevine. Um, suffice to say, Bob is no longer settled on that being the moon either. It's still a bit up in the air with a lot of folks, it sounds. Now, moving on. Next up, soon Jaron from the Jaronism channel will be performing a three mile curvature test that he's been working on for several months now. This test should prove curvature without a shadow of a doubt and I'm willing to bet that we don't see a lick of it. Here's a minute long explanation from his 26 minute video. By the end of it, you'll get the idea. I'm looking forward to this one because, you know, this is really the kind of thing that will get flat earth out of the echo chamber. Take a look. All right, as I'm sure you can see, this is obviously way scaled down, but it is a good representation of the test, and it will help me explain exactly what we plan on doing. So the first thing will be, once everything's set up and lined up, is we will shoot the laser, which will then hit the first post. Uh, when it does, what we'll do is we'll take out that drill with the two-inch drill bit, and we're going to drill right through the post at exactly the place where the laser hit it. Uh, we can mark it off. We'll turn off the laser, drill through it, and then we will have our first post hole done. At that point, we're also going to take a little bit of white paint and just paint that exact spot on the outside so that somebody from our vantage point here would be able to see exactly where that hole was. Next step will be to again turn on the laser. This time it will go through and hit post number two. So you kind of get the point now here. We will take the drill out again, drill through post number two. We will then take the white paint and also mark post number two and so on and so forth down the line until we get all the way down to the third mile and the sixth post. Now I'll talk about it in a second, but really at this point, we're gonna know one way or the other what's going on. In fact, you'll probably know by the third or fourth post. We won't even need to get this far before we kind of have our answer. So have we got a really good answer for why we could not see anything approaching or leaving the sun yet during this eclipse? Well, Globebusters featured a video where Chris Monk gives an explanation or his explanation on the whole thing. He takes an object, puts it in a 3D modeling program called Blender, and attempts to see what a computer program would show us if we recreated this eclipse scenario. He also goes on into explaining why we may be able to see so many eclipse shadows on the leaves of trees during these eclipses. And the, the explanation may surprise you. It comes about 15 minutes into the 36 minute long video. Check out the beginning for an idea of what's expected in this one. So what I did was I went and took a, I went and made a model of an eclipse. This is a 3D screenshot. So this is a, in Blender I made a model put a solid object in the model, put uh, you know the light source behind it, put in the atmospheric part particulate matter to the right ratios and densities of air and with the right anastropic properties of light coming through an air medium and 
hit it with the light to simulate the sun, which is at, and this is to scale, so it's at, you know, one million and a half lumens, and, and the distances are correct, to try and simulate an eclipse. And what the model renders, as you can see, you would expect to see a crescent around the actual object itself as it enters into totality, which no one saw or observed in reality. And then I went to the next phase to say, okay, well, how would the light distribution work within that type of anisotropic particle system? So as light hits a solid object, you would expect to see the same crescent with a little bit of backscatter lighting up around it. As the light comes around a solid object, you would get a rendering of the entire orb, i.e. if it is the moon or a solid object. Next up, Steve Torrance, Mike Cavanaugh, and Dr. Zach have been working frivolously to produce a flat earth model that works based on observable evidence, and especially some evidence pertaining to how the sun may not be a physical object, and how it may be a heck of a lot smaller in size. I'm really excited to see where this research is going because it's starting to correlate with other bits of research that other people within the flat earth community are doing, whether everyone knows or not. But anyway, this next video titled Magnetic Flat Earth 1.0 was featured on Globebusters and should be on your watch list. As usual, you can find everyone's channel and links down below. Make sure that you subscribe to Steve, Mike, and Dr. Zach. It's worth it. Roll that beautiful flat earth footage. To show in a simple way that the sun, for example, is not a physical object, we have measured the disk size of the sun when it moved directly overhead. That result ended up in a 39.8 mile diameter sun. That is a very small object compared to the size of the Earth. If you use that size on any projection on dates like the equinoxes, when almost everybody has a sunrise at 90 degrees east, you will soon find out that most azimuth angles will never work with an object that close and small. If you take any flat projection and place the small sun on the equator on the equinox and place yourself at sunrise, on almost all latitudes, the sun is directly east of your position. If you were able to move north or south in seconds from top to bottom, that small object will remain fixed at its azimuth angle on the horizon, which by rule of geometry makes it impossible to be a small physical object. This led us to do more research into the properties of the sun and its behavior in the sky. Next up, you know what, I should have just named this one the Globebusters episode, but it's Globusters again with an episode that's going to light your fire, wet your noodle, cream your Twinkie, and float your boat. In this video titled Flat Earth, NASA Lies, Illusions, and Non-Spherical Perspectives, a fellow named Iru Landucci shows up for what may break the record for the most times you've had your mind blown in the same two hour time span. Now, he covers a whole lot, and rather than me cutting this thing to pieces and making an extra 40 minutes all about that show, I've decided to display some handy timestamps that you can refer back to for when you head on over there to watch that bad mamma jamma. But I implore you, watch the whole damn thing because you're gonna love it. So what exactly did they talk about? Well, fairly early on, they started making a case for the stars not falling by what should be close to 90 degrees or so from your view in a video of a plane traveling about 6,000 miles over the face of the Earth. That right there is a globe killer. For example, if you're going over the curve of Earth to the point where you're going about halfway across the supposed globe, 
you should be seeing some change in the constellations up there. I mean, it's a pretty significant change in the stars. There was some mention of the History Channel not even having some stock footage of satellites in outer space. And if I heard him correctly, Iru may have done some work for the History Channel, so he ended up having to uh, fake a lot of space and satellites and space footage for something he did for them. But the most fascinating thing I heard about on this show was the SF6 gas. He explains that the dome may be composed of this gas due to the temperature in outer space that uh, could bring, well, anyway, this gas that's in outer space around us can crystallize when it's cold enough, which may explain why ancient civilizations thought there was a crystalline dome. Then at about the like two hour and 45 minute mark or so, he talks about meteors. And um, this is gonna blow your mind too. Like his explanation of what they might actually uh, be in relation to maybe some sort of electric phenomena was pretty fascinating. And for those of you who are studying the electric universe, I mean, you're gonna love it. Um, but really, it, the most fascinating thing about this was if there is a gas that's going, that's surrounding us or the, a gas layer at the outermost level of the atmosphere that's like thicker than air, and when it gets cold, it starts to crystallize like that, I mean, that kind of like hits me in the feels. I wanna do some more research on that. Let me know down in the comments what you think about that phenomena. Then they even go into how like in the 30s and 40s, they would film painted balls in Hollywood to fake space because CGI had to just emulate too many things, you know, like clouds and the evaporation of them as they would go by. That's why older ball earth footage has static cloud formations, like the real old footage. And he follows right into destroying a video by NASA where an astronaut does a flip and gets tangled while another one just whips out a freaking baseball and starts attempting to distract the camera. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up, guys. They're getting pretty sloppy. Then at about the three hour and 30 minute mark, he goes into how Google Earth was basically made. He shows the camera and company involved in making what we've come to know as the ribbons of imagery um, of Earth that was used to put together, you know, that fake globe model to begin with. He even showed us some advanced templates that are used to recreate things like the sun that NASA has showed us before, all kinds of stuff. I mean, I could go on and on and on about what they talked about, but you need to see this one for yourself. Look at the software they're using, it's real stuff. I'm gonna be putting the timestamps of when all these things were talked about in this Globusters episode down in the video description below, uh, right next to the actual video link to help save everyone some time. Be sure to sub up to Iru's channel uh, as well, and I'm gonna have a link there too. Uh, this was just a great episode. Thanks so much to Bob, Jaron, John, and the rest of the Globusters crew for doing that awesome show. Next up, this one surfaced on Celebrate Truth channel. It's titled Flat Earth on Dutch TV with Mike Cavanaugh and Bastian Sorrell. It's exactly what it sounds like too. Flat Earthers made it on Dutch TV and it wasn't a smear job. Can you believe it? The introduction was quite unique and um, they didn't make fools of themselves. Overall, this was a win. Thanks goes out to uh, Ce Celebrate Truth for finding this one and the full video will be down below in the video description. De volgende is voor Margriet. Eindconclusie van internationale conferentie Egmond aan Zee is de aarde is plat. Is dat nepnieuws of is dat uh, echt nieuws? Jeetje, ik vind het zo bizar wat dat de aarde plat is. Dat, het, dat daar een conferentie is in Egmond aan Zee, ja. internationaal hè. En dat ze dan concluderen dat de aarde plat is. Dus misschien ja. is het wel waar. Is het wel waar? Nou, voor het antwoord ga ik even naar mijn gasten. Hallo, oh, Bob Mike en Bastiaan, goedenavond. De aarde is plat. Als ik dat aan jullie vraag, dan zeggen jullie? Ja. Nou ja, ja. En hoe weten jullie dat? dat? Kijken, zelf uh, onderzoek doen in plaats van uh, Discovery of NASA geloof. Ja. Gewoon zelf meten. Even voordat je dat meten uitlegt, weten jullie inmiddels ook hoe de platte aarde eruit ziet? Dat weet niemand. Oh, dat weet je niet. Maar, maar ongeveer, heb je een idee? Is er een, ja, plat. Uh, ja, ja. <laughs> Maar plat, maar plat van je valt eraf. Nee. nee. And I'll leave you all with this. Did the past eclipse show us evidence of an electromagnetic universe? The picture above is, of course, the eclipse. But the picture below is what you get when you use a magnet with a ferrocell. Do you notice any similarities? 
I'm looking into it a bit, but it seems like Globusters may have accepted this as possible evidence as well in a recent video with Chris Monk, Mike Cavanaugh, and Steve Torrance. Here's a small clip of them talking about it to end the show. And that's exactly it, right? You know, the NASA model and the, the current model says that, you know, it's a solar object, you know, millions and millions and millions of miles away. Well, you can't have a localized effect on a magnetic field. And in order to do that, you need particulate matter that could be magnetized in the first place to cause that toroidal field. You have to have a magnetizable particulate local to the object, right? There's yeah. no other way to do it. No. <laughs> yeah, that is extraordinary. Yeah, and you know, I've 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 looked at these pictures for uh, all, all my life, but I never noticed the toroidal field in the light. Never. I've seen hundreds of these pictures, and they, you know, if you look at more pictures of these eclipses, uh, you can see it's everywhere. It's everywhere. The toroidal field is everywhere in the light. All right, everyone, that's all the flat earth stuff that I've got for you. And I want to thank you all for watching the show. And I hope I've saved you a bit of time on your quest for truth, or at least entertained you a bit or both. If you care about me and uh, what I've got going on outside the flat earth, I'm still trucking away at my Fiverr business. Video six is being worked on and video seven is already planned out. It's uh, taking off much better than I expected it to. And I'm really enjoying the community of people that have taken a liking to it and who are taking steps to either start their own fresh business or shape their business with the tips I'm providing. If you want anywhere from a little extra cash to an entire living and you want to do it from home or you want to make money somewhere away from a job that you might not enjoy going to, then check out what I did to get where I am. If you want more time to enjoy life, if you don't want, if you don't like working 40 hours a week, yeah. if you want to do something more soul fulfilling with your life, work for yourself. I didn't need college or startup funds. I just picked something I thought was fun and developed the skills to make money with it, like video work. But hey, most of all, listen to your gut, okay? Your gut is gonna guide you to whatever it is that you're meant to be doing while you're here. It's when you're not listening to that that life becomes unbearable. Mine told me to keep learning more and more and more and more, and eventually I realized about a year later I learned about my craft so much I was making more at home than I was in my last job. I basically took all that knowledge and condensed it into a video series. So check it out. Break away from this stupid system that's harvesting you, okay? It's a little ridiculous that people are just okay with working 40 hours a week towards someone else's dreams. Whee! Lastly, I've been streaming on Twitch for anyone who wants to just hang out and talk flat earth while playing games or whatever. This, uh, this doesn't look so good. Thought I was gonna take a little, a little break. This doesn't look so good. Oh my god. Oh god. <laughs> He's like, oh sh This doesn't look good at all. Oh my god. Dude, it's so creepy, dude. Look at this fish. Look how massive this fish is. I've never seen, he's like, I've never seen this before. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry about your boat. And there's a shark. Bro, he's eating me. <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> That's, that's how it is, <laughs> sometimes. I found out that I can do some IRL or in real life streams over there on Twitch. So I'm gonna be rebroadcasting the Flat Earth Digest there while I'm live in the corner of the screen via webcam or maybe even in the actual Hori Sheet studio. <laughs> if you're lucky enough to catch me going ham on some Twitch, uh, go over there and say hi. I'm having fun looking for ways to spread the Flat Earth truth to gamers, okay, and the youth. So if you wanna show your support, head on over there to twitch.tv slash Hori Sheet Games and say hi when I'm streaming and say hi to the people in the chat. Tell them the Earth's flat. It'll, it'll go a long way, trust me. And speaking of support, you may have noticed I've got a little uh, PayPal me link and a Patreon link at the bottom of my video descriptions. And listen, contrary to the belief of a pitiful few, 
I don't get paid to make these videos. Uh, I don't, nobody's paying me to do this channel. So, uh, you know, if you like my show and you want to support me, um, the best thing to do is to share the show link with your friends or share it on your Facebook page or other social media page. Share it in your favorite Flat Earth group every now and then. And that would be great. Or just leave a donation. Again, thanks everyone for watching. That's all I've got. I'm here to wake people up. Who's with me? once told me to do a search online search for photos of earth he said this shit will blow your mind so I opened up the Google and I looked for photos of earth well, a lot of photos came up he said click on the first he said that's the famous blue marble that everybody's seen we've seen this photo a thousand times upon our TV screen but let me tell you something about that famous shot not a photo at all, man. It was made in Photoshop because there ain't no photographs or but somebody tell me why. They're all just Photoshop cartoons, they're all just CGI. No photographic proof of a globe, no none at all. Why the hell can't no one take a photo of this ball? He was goddamn right. That shit did blow my mind. Cause I thought the blue marble was a photo all this time. Well, don't you think that's strange, he, he said suspiciously. Now, the fact that it ain't a photo seems pretty weird to me. I mean, the most important photo that man could ever take? This huge, iconic image turns out to be a fake? Well, I couldn't quite believe it, man. I, I was pretty shocked. I needed further proof that this photo's photoshopped. He said, look up Robert Simmon. He made that cartoon ball. He's the guy you should research. He works for NASA and all. He openly admits that it's all just artistry. He said, and I quote, it's photoshopped, but it has to be. There ain't no photographs, but somebody tell me why. They're all just photoshopped cartoons. They're all just CGI. No photographic proof of a globe, no Every photo of the Earth is artist trickery. All the photos on Google, man, are as fake as fake can be. Download all the photos and put them side by side. Compare all the continents, they're each a different size. Compare all the colors, each globe a different shade. If all of these were photos, man, they should look the goddamn same. Where's the continuity? There's none, no, none at all. All that NASA gives us is a bunch of cartoon balls Cause there ain't no photographs, but somebody tell me why They're all just Photoshop cartoons, they're all just CGI No photographic proof of a globe, no none at all Why the hell can't no one take a photo of this ball? Now we're supposed to have this telescope, right, that's flying past the stars Taking beautiful photos of Jupiter and Mars well, I've got a small suggestion, NASA. Here's something you could do. Point that thing at planet Earth and take a shot or two because there should be goddamn thousands of photos of where we live. But Hubble ain't taken one. That's suspicious, don't you think? We got all these fancy pictures of spinning galaxies, but not one goddamn photo of the Earth for us to see. Cause there ain't no photographs, but somebody tell me why. They're all just Photoshop cartoons, they're all just CGI. No photographic proof of a globe, no none at all. Why the hell can't no one take a photo of this ball? There ain't no photographs, but somebody tell me why. They're all just Photoshop cartoons, they're all just CGI. No photographic proof of a globe, no none at all. Why the hell can't no one take a photo of this ball?
Don't let those no money lose get you down, baby. The horrid shit shows got you covered.